as you're ready, we'll let you go ahead. Thank you. Okay. It's a tough act to follow. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jared Floyd. I'm also at Red Hat. We've sequestered the Red Hat people together in, uh, in a, a little bunch here in the morning. And I'm going to be talking about a technology called VDO, or Virtual Data Optimizer. So a little bit about myself first, um, because where did this all come from? Uh, I was CTO at a company called Permabit. We had been developing deduplication technology for Linux for about 17 years. Uh, so everything that I'm talking about and everything that, uh, that, we'll, that we're shipping is, is really, really well tested in a whole lot of environments. So um, this is not an early stage project. We're really excited to have something that's really uh, quite complete, available uh, now in the open source community and that uh, works extremely well with cluster and, and, and uh, other layered applications on top of Linux. Uh, so Virtual Data Optimizer, VDO, is a device mapper module that implements data reduction capabilities for Linux. Uh, so this provides 4K granularity thin provisioning. Uh, we're also doing deduplication, inline deduplication at a 4K granularity, and we're compressing all those unique blocks. So basically the whole suite of what you'd expect for getting rid of redundancies in your information, that's available with VDO. Uh, it's at the device mapper layer, so it consumes anything that looks like a block device. Uh, you can give us flash, you can give us disk, it can be local, it can be remote. Uh, you just give us something like, say, 100 terabytes of block storage, and we'll make that look like a whole lot more block storage. And you can do whatever you want with that block storage. So you can put file systems like XFS on top of it. You can use that for Gluster. For, for example, you can put that uh, under Ceph. You can do that under a database. It, it really doesn't matter. We can work with anything that works with block storage. Um, there's two kernel modules that make this work. Um, that there's one called UDS, which is our deduplication index. Um, so there are two big problems with trying to do deduplication. Uh, the first is identifying your duplicate blocks, and then the second is getting rid of them. Uh, and both of them are extremely hard problems to do at scale um, and with, with high performance. So the UDS module um, provides that deduplication index. So that was kind of the first thing, sorry. That was the um, kind of the, f the first thing that we had uh, developed as a company because we said, oh, we know a lot about deduplication. We figured out ways to do really, really uh, fast, really, really memory efficient identification of duplicates. It's kind of like um, a hash map, except it's kind of like a flaky hash map, but it's really fast. And we'll get other people to use it because people love using libraries. And it turns out that it's really, really hard to get people to use libraries and implement them in, in their software. So then we realized, okay, we need to solve the other problem too, which is basically the 4K block virtualization problem. And so the UDS module implements the deduplication index. Uh, could theoretically be available for other applications in the future. I don't, I don't know what those are. Uh, and then the KVDO module uh, does all the rest, makes this a nice device mapper target. Uh, and then there's some user space utilities. There's the VDO command, which um, you can think of doing all the things that, for example, the LVM command lines do. Um, so that's how you create, destroy, modify, etc. cetera, uh, VDO pool. And then VDO stats, which is kind of like DF for VDO. Uh, so I said we were a proprietary software company. Uh, originally, uh, why am I talking about that here at an open source conference? It's because this is now open source. As of Monday, you can go to that URL and there's about 165,000 lines of code for you to, to pour through that uh, uh, cover all, everything that I've talked about here. It's all uh, GPL v2. Thank you. And it's really exciting for us because I think that as a software engineer, you want people running your software. Like that's that's kind of the the main thing that you get out of it. I mean, it's nice to get paid, but uh, the main thing you get is having people run your software. Now we're going from thousands of people running our software to hopefully hundreds of thousands, millions of people running this software. So uh, everyone, um, uh, this this isn't just me. In fact, uh, much like Rick, I don't get to write much software anymore. Um, but uh, that we have about uh, uh, 14 other people who actually are actively writing uh, software that makes this work. Uh, so this is going to ship in the next release of RHEL. I think I'm allowed to say that. If not, oops, it's too late. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're an outer tree module because of the aggressive timeline of wanting to get this out there. Um, but you can go and download that and it should build on, on um, 
on a, a modern or recent kernel. Uh, we're working with the upstream community to address the challenges of getting upstream. So tabs, spaces, camel case, underscores, um, all those really, really exciting things that everyone has extremely strong opinions on and uh, there are coding standards so we have to adapt to those coding standards. There are some real complaints too about exactly how things are structured that we weren't able to use uh, export symbol GPL so now we'll be able to use that, that we have some of our own crypto you know, hashing mechanisms, there's no need to use those when we can use kernel facilities. Um, but we hope to be upstream in nine to 12 months, um, hopefully sooner, we'll see how it goes, that's, that's kind of our next target, that's what we're gonna be working on, uh, but <coughs> excuse me, there is quite a lot of, of software to, to, to pour through here, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of eyes on it, um, and hopefully we'll make everyone happy. So why would you want to do this? I've talked about data, data reduction. I think a lot of this is, is fairly apparent, um, but this has been one of the core user requests for Gluster, you know, really for Linux as a whole, but also for Gluster for, uh, for quite some time. And so the benefit of doing data reduction using something like video is that it increases your storage efficiency and reduces your costs. So uh, if you can make the drives in your system effectively 10 times larger, then that's an enormous cost reduction to your storage infrastructure. It also means that, especially if you're using high performance storage, like Flash or like the, the storage class memory uh, platforms that Rick was talking about, then that's the difference between being able to deploy that in your infrastructure versus not being able to deploy that in your infrastructure. And um, then these are more generic because uh, we're implemented at the device mapper layer. Uh, you can use this with basically anything, um, although we have done quite a lot of testing with Gluster and, uh, and applications layered on top of Gluster to make sure that that works well, um, that it just benefits everything that's layered on top of us. That's why we felt the block layer was the right place to do this. There have been efforts to do this at file system layers, uh, both in Linux and on other platforms. Um, that's great. Um, we have the, uh, the, the block layer is the place we think this makes the most sense because then any sort of data specific parsing can happen at a higher layer and still benefit from the block level deduplication. Uh, another possibility uh, is, of course, if you've reduced the data and you do any sort of replication activities below that, then um, uh, that benefits from the data reduction. And also the technologies we've developed, like are encapsulated in that UDS library, can apply to replication uh, applications as well. Uh, deployment, so I, I borrowed a slide, so that's why I've grayed part of it out, because the most important thing, of course, is on the right there. Uh, as I said, you can use this in any way, but the way it looks like is you have a block device, uh, you have a video layered on top of the block device, uh, you can use LVM on top of that, you don't have to, but otherwise you have maybe a multi-petabyte block device, which you know it's hard to just use all of. Uh, and then you can put a file system like XFS and, on top of that and use that directly as a Gluster volume. Uh, this also does work with the rest of the device mapper stack. So like I said, this is a normal block device. You can use DMcrypt underneath, so if you want full disk encryption, that's not a problem. You can have software RAID, hardware RAID. Uh, uh, again, it just works like a, a device mapper device. So how would you use this? Uh, this should work today, uh, although we, we haven't verified it on every operating system or on, on, on every kernel and every distribution. But uh, today, uh, you should be able to, to clone that repo. Uh, you should be able to build and load the modules. So uh, there's just a, a basic make command that will compile both modules and then you can, you can load them into your kernel. Uh, and then you create a volume. It's really simple, video create, you give it a name. You give it the device that you're going to be layered on top of. Here, I'm using a whole drive, DevSDB, and you give it a logical size. So if you haven't given it a physical size, it'll detect the size of the device. Let's say that's, um, I don't know, let's call it a, a 400 gig flash device. And so then uh, you can tell it that you'd like a logical size. See, here we go, we've got camel case arguments. That's going to be one of those, uh, one of those things that has to change. Uh, you give it a logical size of two terabytes, and, and there you have a device that looks five times larger. Uh, that, has that has changed already. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't think we had fixed that one yet. Right. Uh, then uh, create a file system on top of that, like you would on a block device. Uh, you can mount it, uh, and then you can set it up. Well, do this on multiple machines, of course, and then set it up as a cluster volume using that file system as a brick. There might be some things you've noticed that you might want to do with that, uh, with that beyond just using the storage, and I'll get to that in a moment. 
Uh, and so this is what the uh, output would look like if you ran the video stats command, which is kind of RDF. Um, you can see that there's your two terabytes of 1K blocks, that there's um, a bit of it that's been used for overhead purposes, and that a whole lot of it is available, and um, that the formatting has kicked the 99% space savings. It turns out that an empty device, you get a lot of sa space savings on an empty device. Um, and then the, the DF output um, reflects that, uh, uh, that actual storage. Good question is how much space can you save? How much is this actually worth to the person who's running the software? And um, of course the answer which, which business people hate, but now that we've got, we don't have business people in the room or we have software people in the room, the answer is it depends. Uh, because how much space you can save depends on how much redundancy there is in the data you're storing. Uh, for example, um, uh, one use case that people love to talk about is video archiving. I will tell you right now, you are not going to see a lot of savings in video archiving because uh, there's very little de uh, uh, duplicate data there and it's already compressed. So unless you have some sort of um, uh, um, online video editing platform that's, uh, that's making a lot of extra copies of things. That is not the use case for this software. However, there are tons and tons of use cases for this software, and a lot of them are really big ones like virtual servers and containers. Um, both of those use cases have just outrageous amounts of redundancy in the, the system images that are being used. So that breaks down into two different categories, things that are highly compressible, things that are highly deduplicatable. In the compressible front, uh, databases tend to be actually very, very compressible. Uh, databases care about their data layout being fast. Uh, they don't necessarily care about it being compact. The database vendor, it's not their problem how much space the storage takes up. This is especially the case with, uh, with uh, NoSQL platforms where there's just like so much stuff you can get rid of. So compressible data, databases, logging, messaging, uh, monitoring, alerting, tracing, all of those are really, really compressible data. Uh, then on the, uh, on the uh, deduplication side, redundant workflows. So that's things like backups. Um, even though you know, we're talking about uh, designing the software, we designed the software for primary storage. Uh, you know, I use this for my own backups at home, because why not? Uh, and uh, backups deduplicate extremely well. Just snap, snapshot your entire system image, make another copy. That's OK. There's plenty of bits. Uh, bits to spare. Uh, virtual desktops, virtual servers, uh, and containers, as I said, are just uh, enormously redundant. And of course, uh, home directories. Home directories are a great use case for many reasons. Uh, how many copies of your tree do you have checked out? How many copies across your file server do you have people with checked out identical copies of the same tree with just a couple files changed? Uh, those tend to deduplicate extremely well. And of course, source code compresses well, too. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so Rick points out that uh, when you're stacking things, it's important to stack things correctly. Uh, don't encrypt things before you write them to a video volume because you're not going to get much deduplication or compression. Uh, that, uh, that encryption is specifically about uh, el eliminating or, um, or obfuscating uh, any of that entropy in your, in your uh, data. So if you're using encryption, you should be using encryption below this. You should be using this as a full disk encryption platform or with a, uh, on top of a full disk encryption platform. Uh, so some real world results. Uh, th these are some r real ish world results. Um, so here's just some, some example use cases uh, that, that we had developed internally. Uh, so from left to right, we have some RHEL VMs. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different uh, VMs that we used in house uh, at Permabit. So there, with 15 VMs, we saw about um, you know, more than 5x, close to 6x savings. Um, the, this FCC data, this is just a data set. We, you know, so trying to find good, accurate uh, corpus of data is, is kind of challenging because nobody really wants to publish all of their internal data. So we went and downloaded a whole bunch of stuff uh, from the FCC of uh, records discovery that they had done. That compresses really well. So you can see there's about 70% you know, savings from compression. If you store another copy, amazingly, that, that about doubles. Uh, again, RMAN backups is a, another case where you can have a couple copies of something. It compresses really well because it's a database backup. Make another copy, get, get rid of even more of it. Or here's some realer world data that, uh, that we, we just had from last week, which is um, uh, 
uh, uh, Huaman uh, Chen in our, our QE group uh, took all of the container images from OpenShift Enterprise, so 900 container images, and wrote them to a system. And they're just zero block elimination, so you can turn compression and deduplication individually on and off in the software, although our recommendation is just always leave both of it on, both of them on. Uh, saw very little savings, there weren't a lot of zero blocks there. Um, but compression alone, about 47% savings, deduplication alone, about 81, uh, sorry, 61% uh, savings, and with both of those enabled, about 82% savings. So that's getting rid of about, uh, you know, uh, that's about a five to five to one uh, ratio on uh, on that data set. It went from 259 gigabytes to 49 gigabytes. So those are very real world use cases today uh, for uh, for containers and for for virtual system images. And that's the difference between having to go with disk and using flash, which will just provide you enormous performance benefits. Uh, how does it work? Uh, just a, a quick overview. It's it's the really easy to describe. It's conceptually quite simple. It's just doing these things in a way that's really fast and can scale to usable sizes is the challenge. Uh, we have 4K blocks um, that we start by mapping those, those all to the zero block. Uh, we don't actually have to map them to the zero block. They're just unmapped blocks uh, that yeah, you write, uh, write to a video volume uh, that we break up all those IOs into 4K writes. So uh, Rick was talking about the benefits of larger IOs. Unfortunately, um, you, you won't see uh, those benefits pass through the video layer because we do have to do virtualization at the 4K layer, um, although we're always looking at ways we can improve performance for larger IOs. Uh, that will eliminate any zero blocks right off the bat, that those are pretty easy to recognize. Uh, and then um, we'll, for each of those blocks, we'll identify any that are duplicates with ones that have been written previously only store one copy of those. All these blocks are completely reference counted. Uh, and then the remaining blocks will compress. So we can take those 4K blocks, they'll be compressed individually so you'll get good random I.O. Um, and then we'll um, uh, pack them as best we can into 4K blocks on the storage. I think I've talked about most of this already, but uh, the the key features that you get out of this layer are you do get inline deduplication at that 4K granularity. So um, you'll get it's not a guarantee that every single redundant block will be eliminated, so to deliver good performance, there are cases where we will allow multiple copies of blocks to exist. Um, the important thing is to deliver a usable system, not squeezing every last drop of, uh, of entropy out of your data set. Uh, we do inline compression, that's using LZ4. Uh, we'll eliminate zero blocks before all of that. That's kind of redundant with deduplication, but easier to do first. Uh, thin provisioning over provisioning, so we're not allocating backend blocks until they're written to. Uh, and so this supports up to 256 terabytes of physical storage. Uh, so one pool, and you can have multiple pools, supports up to 256 terabytes. Uh, and that corresponds to at your discretion up to four petabytes of logical storage. So that's quite, quite a lot of storage, especially for uh, a Gluster node, a Gluster volume. Uh, and both physical and logical space can be expanded um, as an online operation. Um, we also support both synchronous and asynchronous modes with this software. Um, and so that, in, in both cases, the software uh, behaves like what you would expect a block storage device to, to act like in synchronous mode. Any block, once it's written, is uh, once you get the, 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 the right returns, you're guaranteed that that write is stable. And asynchronous, you have to do a flush and wait for the flush to return before uh, that I.O. is stable. Why would you want to use the asynchronous mode? Um, the asynchronous mode uh, allows us to try to avoid doing writes altogether. So in like that backup use case where you're seeing 98% savings, you can reduce the wear on your SSD, you can potentially improve performance, you can get better performance out of a disk backend. Um, and uh, that's because we're able to buffer in memory those blocks uh, and get better parallelism out of more IOs coming into the VDO layer. The VDO layer can process up to 2,000 outstanding IOs at the same time. Uh, requirements. Uh, right now we're only doing testing on RHEL 7, but I fully expect this will work on other distributions, um, other uh, kernel versions. Uh, we're x86-64 uh, only today because there are a couple synchronization primitives that we've built uh, that are only available for that architecture. Uh, that will be, uh, will be available on other architectures in the not too distant future. Uh, memory requirements. Uh, there's about a 500 megabyte base requirement for the index and for the, um, the mapping metadata, and then we require 268 megabytes per terabyte of physical storage. So that means that four terabytes of physical storage, which could be 
you know, 40 terabytes, 80 terabytes of logical storage requires about a, a gig and a half of RAM. Uh, in the kernel for, uh, for our wrapping layers. Uh, 16 terabytes of physical storage requires about four and a half gig and, and I'll let you do the rest of the math for there. And then the, um, uh, from a software perspective, from a support perspective, the user space tools are written in Python, so we require Python, um, libc, et cetera. Uh, so what's next? Well, we're open source now, which means that uh, um, that we're available for everyone to run, everyone to, to try and break, everyone to, to tell us what they'd like to see and, and uh, uh, what's not working for uh, for you. Um, that the, the one thing that might be kind of important is free space monitoring. So right now you can monitor the free space by running that video stats tool. There are also SysFS entries um, because if you have a lot of logical storage and you run out of physical storage because you're not getting as much space savings as you'd like, uh, then you'll get an IO error. And that's not good because if you get an IO error, you might have uh, your volume fail and try to rebuild it elsewhere. And if one of your volumes is full, then, or, uh, or one of your bricks is full, then all your other bricks are probably very close to full. And so you can have a cascading failure across your, across your system and make everyone very unhappy. So uh, integrating that space monitoring into Gluster is kind of a very important next step. Uh, other places that can go is through DM event generation, but right now uh, the SysFS uh, or the command line tools are the, the um, the supported ways of doing that. Um, enhancements for uh, to uh, DHT or for data distribution for better deduplication at scale. Um, so uh, if you're running a small cluster system where perhaps you're storing three copies across three nodes, deduplication is fantastic because you have the entire data set on every single node. As you scale your cluster larger and larger, you're fragmenting that data set. And you'll still get all the benefits from compression, but your deduplication benefits will be restricted. Um, so there are ways that we can do hinting at where deduplication is, uh, will, uh, where to place data for better deduplication, but then you can't be placing uh, your data pseudo randomly. So looking at ways we can do that uh, is an important next step. Uh, deduplication enhancements for replication. Um, that's an obvious one where uh, if you have, uh, depending on your replication scenario, um, our software libraries could be uh, suitable for that. And finally, documentation, best practices and automation. That this is really easy to deploy, but this should be integrated into, um, into uh, automated deployment scripts for, for Gluster so you don't have to go through additional manual steps. Uh, so if you have any questions, complaints, uh, anything like that, uh, that's my email address. Um, I'll be here today and tomorrow as well. Uh, we also do have a public mailing list, video develop, uh, at redhat.com, and there's a, a link for that if you'd like to, to join us and discuss further. Uh, so, uh, any questions? Yeah. Sorry? Sorry. So, I think the question is do you have addressed deduplication or is it inline? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is only done as uh, as inline deduplication. Um, in that, uh, the question was, do we have uh, any sort of post process capabilities or inline uh, or in place upgrades? Um, so the uh, the answer is that you know. If, if you want to upgrade a system to add deduplication, we can't do anything uh, in place because it's just a completely different data format. You can, of course, remove a brick, install the software, uh, add the brick back in with deduplication. Um, also, there's no way to do post-processing of existing software without, uh, or of existing da data um, that for performance reasons, we see that inline is, is the right way to go about doing things um, that in most systems, there's never a chance to go and catch up later. Yes. So what's the performance uh, Ah, that's an ex excellent question. I did not have any slides about performance. Uh, so uh, what is the performance impact of this layer? Uh, I'll say that our performance is very, very good. I won't describe it in terms of percentage impact because that depends a lot on your platform and it depends a lot on your data set. But I can tell you uh, the levels of performance that we've seen in a lot of systems. So uh, uh, performance on kind of a modern, 
uh, server class system, server class processor, we see about 30,000 random write, 4K write operations per CPU core that's available to the system, about 100,000 uh, random reads per CPU core. Uh, you don't see a lot of performance improvement for uh, sequential operations because everything has to be decomposed into a 4K uh, I.O. So uh, we have systems where we've demonstrated in excess of a million IOPS uh, against this, uh, that, that it's, it definitely can give you very high performance, especially on a flash-based system. Um, the impact, though, I mean, it could be uh, 10 percent, it could be 40 percent or 50 percent, depending on what your platform looks like. So it's really going to, to vary based on your environment. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, the slide which showed cluster numbers, uh, yeah. Um, that or? The one before this? This one? Yeah. Right. Uh, what is the distribute count here? What is the volume configuration? Is like what is the distribution on this? Yeah, this, is this was this was a three-node system. So this was this was with full replication. So this was a, a three-node system with with a full copy on each system. Okay. I think this was uh, actually a, a, a Rye system, so the hyperconverged platform. Okay. Anything? Else? Anyone else? Yeah. Rumors are that the video is being used by some of the cybersecurity yeah. Ah, uh, so the question was, uh, there are rumors that this technology is being used by some of the storage vendors. Can I disclose who they are? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, Rick, can I disclose? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, we can tell you, Gerald, but not, not on public. Yeah. I, think we, I think typically anybody who uses it under pre-Red Hat acquisition terms is probably protected by NDAs. Yeah, um, you, can, you can see who, uh, I think the Permabit website is still up and you can see vendor names there. Um, uh, but uh, yes, there are vendors that are using either the library portion or the video portion in the field today. And, that, and so, uh, as I said, this is, this is really uh, quite tested software uh, that, uh, that uh, we expect that the release that's available now. Well, this is an alpha release of our <laughs> of our next version, but uh, we're, we don't expect any sort of stability or reliability concerns. 